It is a pleasure, a privilege, and an anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you this morning. First of all, I want to thank our first elder who prepares the bulletins for us. I want to thank him for the courage of printing the title to my remarks this morning. The title is not designed to amuse you or to be clever. This title deals with what I believe is the most misunderstood topic and possibly the most controversial topic in all of the New Testament. Some have told me that they refuse to preach on Romans 7, 1 through 6. Because the words that the Apostle Paul uses in these six verses can be easily misunderstood and because of the sensitivity of the topic, it can cause great damage. I choose to study this topic with you because I am convinced that it is crucial for each one of us to understand how and why Christ delivered us from the law. That may sound like a contradiction to you, but it is not. Jesus cannot come back to this earth until he finds a generation of people that understand why and how he wants to deliver them individually from the law. The Apostle Paul makes a very, very controversial statement in Romans 6.14 that in his day nearly cost him his life. Let me read it to you or quote it to you. Romans 6.14 for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are no longer under law, but under grace." End quote. In Paul's day, the Jews did not make a distinction between the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and the ceremonial law, the sacrifices. And nearly cost him his life when he wrote Romans 6.14. You can read it for yourself in Acts 21, verses 27 and 28. So what is Paul talking about when he says the law? The law or sin shall not have dominion over you. This topic should be of extreme interest to you. Because one of the greatest controversies in the history of our church took place in the late 1800s when the administrators of this denomination and their scholars did not understand what law the Apostle Paul was writing about in Galatians 3, 24. The second reason that I study this topic with you this, today is because Seventh-day Adventists are known worldwide as students of the word. I learn why this reputation came about when I was about eight years old. When I was about eight years old, I lived in a little town in Cuba where the Inter-American Division of Seventh-day Adventists had also established their office. And one day, I saw these children about my age looked like me, light hair, light colored eyes, playing a game that I associated with Canada and northern United States. It's a game that is played on frozen lakes, ponds, and on ice rinks. In Cuba, there are no frozen ponds or lakes. And in that day, there were no ice rinks. So I was fascinated. They played what we know today as street hockey. They used roller skates, a sawed-off broomstick, and an empty tin can. And one of the children saw me watching them, and he said, why don't you join us? And I said, I'd like to. So he asked me, do you have a pair of roller skates? And I said, I do. Why don't you join us tomorrow? Bring your roller skates, a sawed-off broomstick, and we will provide the empty can. <laughs> and I did this for several days. 
Then I showed up on Saturday to play street hockey with them. And there was no one to be found. So the next day when I played street hockey with them, I asked them, I showed up yesterday, where were you guys? And they said, we were in Sabbath school. And I said, you guys go to school on Saturday? They said, no. And they saw this puzzled look on my face. So they said, why don't you join us next Saturday and find out what Sabbath school is about? I did. In Sabbath school, after a prayer was offered, the teacher got up and invited anyone that was interested to come up and recite the memory verse for that week. And these kids paraded up there one by one and they'd had this little square card in their hand. On the top was a beautiful color picture, Bible picture. Then below was a scripture. And below that was a scripture spelled out. And all but a few had to look at that card. Most of them had memorized that memory verse. I said, wow, I wonder if I can do that. So after Sabbath school, I went to the Sabbath school teacher and I said, could I have the memory verse card for next week? And she said, oh, you precious child, you want to come visit us again? And I said, yeah. Well, I memorized that memory verse and I didn't know I, was, I would be able to. So when next Sabbath came, and she invited the students to the kids to come up and, remember, and recite the memory verse, I came up, and God blessed me, even though my knees were knocking against each other, and I recited the memory verse. I then, after Sabbath school, asked her, could I have the memory verses for the previous Sabbath of that quarter? And she said, oh, that's wonderful. You want to continue to come? And I said, yes. Time does not permit me to share with you why those kids memorized that memory verse every week. But I learned as a young child why Seventh-day Adventists are known around the world as students of the Word. I share this incident with you because I want for each one of you now to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Because Paul makes a statement in Romans 7, verse 1 that we should understand very, very clearly. When you're there, say ready. ready. Here we go, verse 1 of Romans 7. Or do you not know, brethren, and now we have an opening bracket, Continuing, for I am speaking to those who know the law, closing bracket, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Why do we have that opening and closing bracket? For I am speaking to those who know the law. Supply. When my youngest son was a student missionary in Ecuador, during the school year of 1994-1995, we would speak on the phone on a regular basis. And one time that we spoke, he asked me a very interesting question. He says, Papa, I've been earning an income in a foreign country. Is it necessary for me to file an income tax return with the Internal Revenue Service? And my response was, if you're a citizen of the United States and you have a pulse and you're earning income, I don't care where it is on planet Earth, you have a responsibility and obligation to file an income tax report with the Internal Revenue Service because you're still living under the jurisdiction of the laws of the United States. God's law also has requirements. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve chose to disobey and in so doing, they introduced the sin problem. So according to Romans 7, 1, each one of us is responsible for knowing what? The law. Now, let's take a look at verses 2 and 3 of Romans chapter 7. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. Verse 3. So then... 
If while her husband is living she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not called an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. In verse 2, we have a very interesting word. It's B-O-U-N-D, bound. In the Greek language, that's spelled D-E-O. And in the Greek language, the actual meaning of the word bound is stuck with. You are stuck with something. That's literally what the word means in the Greek language. Now, God originally intended for Adam and Eve to rule jointly. Genesis 1, 26 and 28 is very clear about that. After sin entered their lives, God says to the woman, Your husband shall rule over you. Genesis 3, 16. Unfortunately, that passage has been horribly misunderstood and abused. And I'm convinced that it's misunderstanding of this passage that causes the spousal abuse and the emotional abuse of husbands towards their wives. Even though God made it very clear in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, that husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loves the church. So the word bound is applying to the marriage relationship after sin entered this world. What I want to focus on this morning, however, is verse 2 and 3. Why is Paul addressing verse 2 and 3 to the woman? When he says very clearly in verse 1 that all of you, both men and women, know what? The law. The answer to that question will be the key to our study this morning. And I hope that the answer will become very clear to you by the end of this study. Why would any woman who knows the law consider marrying another man if she knows the law? Now that's a scenario that Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago. So let's bring that scenario that Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago to our day today. Let's suppose that we have a couple in their late 40s. They have raised their children. Their children have been educated, married. They have careers. And they've not only left home, but they've left the city that they were raised in. The woman find herself, finds herself with a lot of time on her hand, and she says to herself, you know what? I studied a career in college. I'm going to look up the classified ads and see what's available in the career that I studied. And she finds an ad that kind of catches her attention. She calls, they grant her an interview, she goes on the interview, guess who interviews her? The owner of the company. He's very impressed with the resume, and he hires her. She can hardly wait to get home because she's so excited and she wants to tell her husband. When she gets home, her husband is already there and he doesn't seem very happy. She shares with him the experience of that day and he says, why do you need to get a job? Don't I provide enough funds for us to live in the style that we live in? She says, yes, you do, sweetie, but I have all this time in my hand I studied a career in college, and now I want to be productive, not so much because we need more money, but because of the personal satisfaction that I want to experience, which is the reason why I studied this career when I was in college. He's still not very excited. So she begins her job, and her first day after work, she comes home, and she wants to tell her husband about how well things went, but again, he's not very happy. He's not very happy because he's used to having his meal ready for him when he comes from work. And he tells her so. So she says, why don't you join me in the kitchen? We'll fix dinner real quick. And he says, that's not my responsibility. <laughs> that is your responsibility. So she's not getting any sympathy or help from her husband and beginning to feel a little bit of condemnation. But at work, things are going great. Unfortunately, every day she comes back from work, she meets a very grumpy husband. And this goes on 
for an extended period of time, years, she finally reaches the point where she decides she's going to put an end to this marriage. But she's a Seventh the Adventist. And she knows that she cannot get a divorce unless it's on biblical grounds. So he, she calls her best girlfriend and explains the situation to her. And the girlfriend says to her, I have an idea. Your husband works out at the same spa that I do. And I've been working out recently with an absolutely gorgeous woman. And she's single. Why don't I drop a hint that your husband is a male? And see what happens. The frustrated one says, do it. About two months elapses, and the girlfriend calls the frustrated wife, and she says, we need to get together. And the wife is kind of excited. When they get together, the girlfriend says to her, your husband is 100% true to his marriage vows. He hasn't reacted in any way to this woman. So the frustrated wife says, you know what? I'm going to have to take this matter into my own hands. So she goes to work the next day and asks her boss if she could get off three hours on a specific day. Three hours before quitting time. And she says, sure. On the designate, designated day, she goes to the grocery store and buys the ingredients for his favorite dinner. She then goes and makes a second stop and buys something that she's never purchased before. She then goes home, prepares the dinner, and when her husband gets there, he opens the door and he picks up the fragrance from the kitchen. And he says, Sweetie, you have fixed my favorite dinner. Let me wash up and I'll be right back. He comes, sits down at the table. She serves his plate full and then she adds a deadly poison called arsenic. She mixes it up and she brings it to me, and then she goes to the kitchen to wait for the sound that will indicate that he's passed. Fifteen minutes elapsed, and guess what she hears? Honey, that was wonderful. Could I have, what, a second serving? She can't believe what she's hearing, but she goes, gets the plate, fills it up, and this time she pours the rest of the poison in there, mixes it up, takes it to him, and he consumes that in about 15 minutes. And he says, honey, that was wonderful. Thank you for making this beautiful dinner for me. This is what I have been missing all of this time since you have been working. Question, why doesn't the husband die? In the illustration of Romans 7, 2 and 3, the husband is the law. And the scripture is very clear in Romans 7, 12. The law is holy, just, and good. The law, however, has some limitations, as we studied for 14 weeks in the book of Galatians. The law was never designed to give sympathy or help. Remember Romans 8, 3? For what the law could not do, weak as it was, you know the rest. So, she realizes that life is going to continue the same way. And she's very, very frustrated. In this illustration, the law can not only not give us sympathy or help, but when we do not live to every specific of the law, what did we learn in Galatians 3.10? The law curses us and then condemns us. She's a very frustrated wife, but at work things are going absolutely great. She is experiencing more fulfillment in his, her job. And one of the reasons that she's experiencing this fulfillment is because her boss at work 
is very sympathetic with the fact that she's been out of the workforce for 20 some years. But he compliments her and appreciates the quality of her work. And that makes her feel very, very good. She is now conscious that she's becoming very, very attractive, attracted to her boss. Who do you think her boss is? Jesus Christ. Why does she find her boss so attractive? He sympathizes with her. Is that biblical? Hebrews 4.15. He is helpful. Is that biblical? Hebrews 2.18. And he doesn't condemn her when she makes a mistake. Is that biblical? Romans 8, 1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those that are where? In Christ, In Christ Jesus. Let's not forget the context. Your Bibles make a separation, a division between Romans 6.23 and Romans 7. But the context, the topic, does not change. Let me read Romans 6.23 to you. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does the two represent? And what does the five fingers represent? In Romans 5, 15, 16, and 17, Paul explains how we're saved. And in those three verses, he says that salvation is free, and five times he says it's a gift. Who says that the wages of sin is death? The first husband. In my application, the law. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 56? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is what? The law. The law says to you and to me, sinners, you must die. Does grace say to you and to me, you must die? No, grace says to you and to me, I have a free gift for you. What is that gift? And to whom is it offered? To me, a sinner. And what is the gift? Eternal life. Back to my application. And the problem why the first husband will not die. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18? Not one word or stroke of the law will be done away with until all of heaven and earth disappear. In my application of Romans 7, 2 and 3, we have a woman that wants her husband to die. But all of her efforts to get rid of him have been a total failure. She now approaches her boss at work and she expresses to him how much she appreciates and admires him for helping to find new purpose in life through her job in his company. Her boss responds by saying, I have noticed you admiring me, but you are a married woman. And she says, yes, but I am miserable in my marriage. He then says to her, her boss, the first thing that you need to do is to make your present marriage null and void. She says, how? I've tried everything. I tried to get him involved in a relationship with another woman so that I could get a divorce on biblical grounds. And I'm ashamed to say to you that I even tried to poison him, but he wouldn't die. Everything I've tried has failed. Her boss says to her, let me save you a lot of time and frustration. From a human point of view, 
It is impossible for you to get rid of your husband. But I have a solution for you. She says, please tell me. He says to her, why don't you die? And she says, have you lost all your mental faculties? <laughs> if I die, how can I marry someone else? Oh, he says, I didn't mean for you to die by yourself. Why don't you let me put an end to you, terminate your life to your present marriage, and then I will raise you and make you my wife. Can you do that? And is it biblical? In Romans 7, Paul indicates in verse 2 that it is the husband that must die in his illustration. But in the application, it is the woman, you and I, that must die. What is the solution to this woman's hour dilemma? Turn to the right. And I want for you to read, follow me very carefully as I read verse 4 of Romans 7. This is the solution. Ready? Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law, the first husband, through the body of Christ. Why? That you might be joined to another husband, to him who was raised from the dead. Two things happen when we choose to die in Christ. The first thing is that we're delivered from the sin condition. Not the verbs, but the sin condition that produces the verbs. The second thing that happens is that we are delivered from under the law, even though the law is still in existence. The law does not go away. Does that mean that we can now live our lives as we please, as our sinful nature choose to? Yeah. Is that what Paul is writing about here? You're still married. We're not talking about widows. We're not talking about single people here. You're still married to someone. Why are we still married? And for what reason? Does the boss tell her that he wants to put an end to her life and marry her? And raise her up? Look at the last part of verse 4 of Romans 7. That we might bear fruit for God. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the same thing to his disciples in John 15, 5. When he said, you are the branches, I am the vine. If you focus on abiding in me, I, the vine, will do much fruit production in you. Now let's take a look at Romans 7, verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the first husband, the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for what? Death. For death. Verse 6. Romans 7. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were stuck. Your Bible says bound. But we know what the word bound means in Greek. You're stuck. So that we now serve in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Having died in Christ, we are immediately released from the first husband, the law. And we simultaneously begin keeping the righteous requirements of the law, as we just got through reading in Romans 7, 6, and which Paul mentions again in Romans 8, 4. God not only guarantees the re these results, but he assures us that we will enjoy the trip. Let me paraphrase for you Hebrews 2.15. And will deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. 
If, however, you and I, after learning what we have read in verse 4, that we have the opportunity to join another, another husband, Jesus Christ specifically, once we know that, and we choose to continue to live in the, the, under the condition